Yo, 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 yo! It's time for Sunday School Bonanza, a This Week in Mormons production where we go over gospel doctrine lessons and make you better prepared to be there. That's our whole plan anyway. We'll see how we do over the next little while. I'm joined once again by my wonderful friend, Kurt Frankum yo, yo, of yo, yo. LDS.com. Yo, yo, what up, Jeff? Bishops don't talk that way. Wow. Stop it. Sorry. Well, just following your lead, man. I was going to be boss for you. If you're going to say yo, yo, you've got to say it more like a more ambitious and be like, yo, 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 guys. Yo, this yo. is super. <laughs> what a great time we're all having. Pass the sun chips. That's what you need. <laughs> I'm not a nerdy bishop. I'm, okay. I'm hit, man. I'm going to go drive my Volvo station wagon. I wear skinny <laughs> ties to church. Okay, that's good. <laughs> be, be a rebel and wear a subtle pattern in your shirt on Sunday and nice. see what happens. All right, uh, folks, once again, thanks for being with us. Uh, we're in the New Testament manual. We're getting into it now deeper in the year. Lesson six, they straight away left their nets. I love the content in this lesson. I think there's some terrific material here. We're in Luke 4 and Luke 5, as well as Matthew 10. Read those to get yourself prepped and and make it happen. The the, awesome. the attention activity is a bit weak, Jeff. It's just a question. Oh, tell me. It says, uh, have a class member read the first part of... Oh, boy, my printer didn't print that. Um, the scripture. <laughs> Explain that... Mosiah, 20, Mosiah 27, yes, thank 31. You. Explain that Jesus Christ, second coming, everyone will recognize him as the Savior. Those... This was not true at the first coming. The Jews had studied prophecies about the Savior's coming for centuries, but many of those who heard Jesus failed to recognize him as the Savior. So then uh, it says, point out that the first part of the lesson will discuss what happened when Jesus first announced that he was long awaiting Messiah. Other parts yep. of the lesson will discuss Jesus calling uh, the apostles as the spread his message. So I would much rather... I. I reference you to the uh, at the end of the lesson we'll talk about the original 12 could you think you could name all the original 12 apostles jeff nope yeah me neither but uh be a good activity see who could maybe bring some brownies and give them a, a brownie if they if they uh can read that so or <laughs> name them all anyways that that to me is much more effective attention activity so B- B- barabbas was he one of them no Barabbas? No. You know, there's I'm, a, I'm joking. I know who Barabbas was. I'm not an idiot, Kurt. Uh, you know, there are two Judases, which makes me feel bad for the other Judas who didn't uh, <laughs> deceive. He's like having to explain his name throughout eternity. Like, I was one of the Your original name is 12, Bud. but I wasn't that guy. Okay. So. He's like, it was the other guy. He's a, he's a, yeah, he's up there <laughs> waiting. for. Uh, yes. I, I do feel bad for him. Yeah. Um, Luke 4, very strong. And, and as I've read through this for this lesson, it's hit me. A lot more than it maybe did before. And this is when Jesus is brought to uh, the synagogue. He's in Nazareth. You know, he's not in Jerusalem yet or anything. It's, so it's basically his local synagogue where he grew up. So as would be normal in any sort of service, peop- there are readings done from the Torah. And so he was brought up to to read some passages. But he takes it to another level here. But I think it's it's super awesome. So it says, uh, you know, he's given the book of Esaias, which is Isaiah in Greek. So he's going to read the book of Isaiah. And this is what it says in verse 18. It says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised. 19, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. But then I love that um, and then 20, And he closed the book and he gave it again to the minister and sat down. And the eyes of all them that were in the synagogue synagogue were fasted on him. And 21 is just bold. And he began to say unto them, think about this, while sitting down, he just said, this day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. Woof, mic drop. It pretty much is a mic drop, yeah. That was cool. That's great. And the church has a great video clip you can show during the lesson. Encouraged, yeah. Oh, yeah. Perfect. It's really good. It's very, very strong, and it shows the same thing. But, I mean, I've, I've, I guess I've visualized it more reading through it this time and studying it and really seeing, like, he gets up there, he reads the Scripture deliberately, and he also quotes Isaiah, which is a very revered prophet, especially in preaching of, of the Messiah for Jews. So he, he knows what he's doing, as he often de- as he demonstrates throughout his ministry. And then kind of as he's sitting down, everyone's looking at him, he just says, yeah, this Scripture is fulfilled now. I am he. And that is 
And the amazing thing is, of course, people were confused. I mean, right? Because this is this is just this is Jesus, the who son grew up of in Joseph. Neighborhood. Yeah, this is just that carpenter's boy who's been hanging out here and just lives in our town. He's been here his whole life. We've all known him. What's he doing, getting up here now, saying that the scripture is fulfilled in him? What's that all about? That's not. It's not what he's supposed to do. And it makes you think of like you know, every once in a while you may come across a, a, an interesting article or a, 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 an interview with a guy that claims to be Jesus, and you're like, whoa. That guy's crazy, you know, but I think a lot of people then really uh, reacted that way of saying, yeah. what do you mean, you know? I thought that too. It's very, like we, you know, guys claiming to be prophets or or whatever, you know, or, um, uh, you know, rapture enthusiasts and stuff like that. And, and it's very easy. We roll our eyes. We laugh about it. You see, you know, Daily Show and everybody will make fun of all these right. things and we yeah. all laugh together. And then I take a step back and realize, but wait a second, I believe very firmly in the man who stood up and was announced himself as the one to redeem Israel. Like how is that any less from, you know, an objective point of view, how is that any less radical and and almost wacky in the same sense? So, so in that sense, okay, I'm going to empathize a little bit more with those who have the out there views. I'm not saying I'm going to go subscribe to it and buy in and say, well, I believe you too. Right. And come. And thankfully his second coming will be a bit more dramatic and, uh, we will not be able to deny who it is that's on the scene. So that's 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 true too. Um, and the other thing, of course, and this goes on through his whole ministry, Jews were very confused about what Messiah really meant, and I think they very much expected a grand entrance of someone to come and redeem Israel and fix everything. So that's yeah. another reason they were confused by just some boy who'd been there their whole lives, born in town, just claiming this, and then likewise they expected political deliverance yeah. okay they thought a messiah was going to come and remove roman control of israel because ever since the captivity starting with the assyrian one for the northern kingdom but then the babylonian captivity they'd never been independent yeah ever, ever since that time and so they were kind of thinking like it's going to get back to the glory days we're going back to king david this is this is what we're getting back to now but right. that was not to be the case yeah and like you said many kind of expected a political revolution and a carpenter's boy um isn't exactly who they had in mind to do this, and so I think that lent to more doubt of saying, no, you you must be confused. Yeah, exactly. So now he needs some apostles, Jeff. Where does he go? Okay. Well, he goes to the Sea of Galilee. That's right. He gets some, which is a beautiful place out here. I have not been myself. I'd love to go and fish. And for if, and if no one knows where this, Galilee today is, I believe, way up in northern Israel, uh, right along the Syrian border, mm-hmm. if I'm not mistaken. So uh, he goes there, so, and so what does he go up there? What's he doing? Well, up there? he he goes up there and uh, and finds Simon Peter, who uh, we all know and love as Peter, James, and John, and they are uh, they're fishing, and uh, Jesus Christ teaches them how their lives will change. Um, and we we talked about how it would be interesting to know if Christ really knew them much before he went to the the lake seeking them as apostles, or or, or vice versa, I guess. Huh? <laughs> like if, or if they, Kurt's still sick, folks. It's been Sorry, a month. I know. He's still I'm, sick. I'm crying. <laughs> yeah, or if they really knew Christ. Because I picture that like if they didn't have much of a relationship with him, the man shows up and that, he must have emanated such strong spirit because he just said, you know, come follow me and I will make you fishers of men. And well, as the scripture says, and they straight away left their nets and followed him. Without, without a word, without contesting anything, without protesting, they just said, okay. That's faith. That's, I, I'm dropping my net. I hope I'm and that more, type of guy, but I don't know. That'd be tough. I think we, yeah, it's, I think it's hard to be that kind of person. I think we often want to, the Lord might call us to do something and we want to say, all right, but can I have like five minutes? Yeah, right. Just to send, send a couple emails, get a couple things in order. And sometimes, no, the Lord demands things of us immediately. But I, what I really see the parallel here is is the impressions that we receive through our own personal revelation that the Lord expects us to act on things when we receive that inspiration and if we demur if we fail to do stuff he's less inclined to to bring it around again later on so we have to be willing to act and that usually act promptly when we receive a particular set of inspiration whatever that may be and these apostles well at this point disciples we'll get to that distinction in a second but they, they they demonstrated that exact same level of faith. And Simon wasn't just some like bumpkin with his with his nets in his boat. I mean, he was a well-established, successful fisherman with an industry in the area yeah. of fishing. And he just he just dropped it and said, "Nope. Okay. 
I will follow Jesus. And, and of course, we see Peter was so imperfect throughout the scriptures, but he felt enough to follow. Yeah, and I think we see that in the life of President Monson as well, where early on he sort of had to learn this lesson of, hey, listen, Tommy Monson, when I uh, when I tell you to do something, I need you to do it. And there's various stories of him learning that to the point where he would just act right away when he got that prompting. And it's inspiring. I want to be that type of person. Yeah. Do not delay, you know, and, and what I've seen time and again is those who respond promptly become even stronger in the spirit and are better able to to lead going forward. Um, so break this down for me, though, if you would. Obviously, we talk about them being he calls them as his disciples and then apostles come later on. What's the distinction there? Because I think we blur those lines, especially because in the Book of Mormon, Jesus calls his 12 disciples among the Nephites. Right. And so it's very easy to kind of conflate the two. So what, what, what are the distinctions? Yeah, you know, modern day times, you know, many people may not, I don't know, I don't know many people, but apostle is actually an office in the Melchizedek priesthood. And so, uh, you know, being called and set apart as apostle come with it certain authorities and, uh, you know, keys and, and so forth that allow you to do and act in certain ways, where disciples more maybe a, an interpersonal choice of saying, I will follow Jesus Christ. And so I maybe wonder if Christ was waiting for, you know, the, obviously these disciples had made the choice to follow him, but I don't know, maybe he was looking to see if he needs some backups or, you know, were, were these individuals the right fit to be the apostles that will carry on his kingdom after um, after he is destroyed? Um, yeah. So I, Well, and that— Sorry, keep going, well, keep going. Yeah, and in the lesson it goes through various references, and you can, you know, the teacher could spend a lot of time on this, and it really is an intriguing discussion of why is it important that Jesus called apostles? Um, sure, how sure. did he choose them? Um, let's see. And then down, then further down in, in the third section of the lesson, it says, after Jesus called the 12 apostles, he gave them priesthood power and instructed them in their responsibilities. And it talks about they had the power to to heal the spiritually and physically sick. They are sent to the lost sheep of Israel to preach the kingdom of heaven um, is at hand. They are to use mm -hmm. their priesthood power to bless and heal people. They are to seek out those who are prepared to hear the gospel. They are to teach as guided by the Spirit. They are to give their lives entirely to the Savior's work. And so obviously these are pretty, you know, these are skills that need to be developed. And, and, and so... I think Christ yeah. really played a role in developing them to be the Peter, James, and John that we read about uh, later on in the in the New Testament. Yeah, I mean the contrast is amazing when you read the Gospels and then compare it even to the Book of Acts and see the difference yeah, in the way they were able to manage different people. The, yeah, yeah, total one eighty. I mean, even though he gave them authority and power to heal people, I think it's safe to say they might have doubted themselves at the outset because you don't very much typically just start seeing them just run and say, great, boom, let's go start healing. I think they still deferred to the Savior in most in most instances until they became more, more comfortable, yeah. perhaps you could say. Um, yeah, it's very interesting here. And I like the difference between apostle and disciple. I think you hit it, hit the nail on the head. We're all disciples. I mean, a disciple is a willing follower of Christ. So they were disciples when they left their nets and followed him. They were being disciples. And it was only later that Christ chose them and called them as apostles. That's a clear distinction because we don't run for the office of apostle. We don't lobby for it or push for it. There's no elite stuff or whatever that makes it happen. I mean, the Lord calls whom is required in that moment. And I, and I think it's, yeah, you could look at our apostles today and say, yeah, but most of them are like, you know, dudes who were successful businessly and blah, 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 blah. And you could make all these assumptions about how there's an archetype associated with modern day apostle. But I don't think it's the case, really. I think it's a case of, well, just simply that, uh, sorry, I'm, I'm losing my train of thought there for a second. But just that, that you know, these apostles are, these are good men who are worthy to serve. And oftentimes they might already have some tools necessary to excel in that role. But I guarantee if you were to talk to any of the 12 at the first presidency, if they felt prepared when they received their calling, like that life had prepared them for it, they might say like, yeah, I had some experiences that have been helpful, but when it really comes to it, most would tell you, I felt totally like scared out of my mind lost oh, yeah. when it came to this. And there, there, you can find many anecdotes from the brethren about, like I think you've got like President Eyring talking about the first time he was brought in to do missionary callings. Yes. And he just sat there. I think President Packer just said something. He's like, all right, well, uh, 
you look at that tell me how you feel and he was like seriously like this right. is- <laughs> and i remember the story of when elder holland was called and he just basically walked in the room of the 12 and and was just weeping i mean i can't imagine feeling comfortable walking into the room and sitting with that body and and being like oh i'm one of you now like where's where's yeah. the handbook you know it, it's just not one of those deals so there's a learning curve and there is no handbook right. that we know of Ooh. but uh <laughs> I think it's so it's so important that we have apostles. And the main reason Christ called them was to prepare them, and in particular to prepare them to be able to carry on his work once he was gone, because he knew he would be gone. And he knew he would need to leave his work in the hands of, of fallible mortals who would then be charged with spreading the gospel, with establishing his church, and uh, ensuring that it survived, even though there was going to be an apostasy later on. But uh, that's why he calls apostles, and that's why we have them today, to serve as special witnesses of Christ, to admonish us worldwide, and to ensure that... True and pure doctrine is taught to all of us globally. It's true. And even though the apostles the apostles worked on a relatively smaller scale, but even they branched out across the eastern half of the Mediterranean for the most part yeah. during their ministry. So they had plenty of work to do. And just like our apostles today, they might fly around in jets, but it's no different than Paul hopping on a boat yeah. and going from from Tyre to Ephesus, you know, and for whatever reason. Can I conclude with a quote from Spencer W. Kimball? Yeah, wrap us up. Take us home. It says... No one in this church will ever go astray for who ties himself surely to the church authorities whom the Lord has placed in his church. This church will never go astray. The Quorum of the Twelve will never lead you into bypaths. It never has and never will. Amen, brother. There we go. Now, that can be a hard lesson to learn sometimes for many of us, but... Stick by it. I am convinced that if we follow our leaders, even if we don't always understand, we will be fine in the long run, no matter what ever happens around us. I think it'll be okay. There we go. Kurt, bless you for being here. Hey, thanks, Jeff. Love it. Hope I get to come back. Always a pleasure to have you. We hope all of you will join us at thisweekinmormons.com. Subscribe to this podcast in iTunes or Stitcher Radio. If you haven't done that, you're missing out. In a, and we also have an RSS feed. If you're an Android person, just grab our RSS feed. Very easy. We include all of it with every time we post one of these shows at thisweekinmormons.com. Any method you need, we got it right there. So pay us a visit. Find the lesson you need or, or the podcast. And then boom, lawyered. It's over. It's great. So visit Kurt at leadingLDS.com as well and get better with leadership. He will help you with that as he does time and time again. And we hope you all have a wonderful week. Kurt, be well. Thank you. I'm, uh, this is Sunday School Bonanza. Once again, lesson six. They straightaway left their nets. May you straightaway leave your nets. <laughs>